All right, so we're back for lecture 14, uh, Real Analysis, and today we're discussing the topic of compact sets. Um, so compactness is largely uh, motivated by the extreme value theorem in calculus. So an important calculus theorem you'll probably remember is that if you have a continuous function on uh, this closed interval from A to B, then such a function achieves its maximum value. So the uh, properties that um, make this, this theorem work are, first of all, the function is continuous, uh, but just as important as the function being continuous is the domain of the function here. So there's two important properties, and you can kind of uh, think of some counterexamples for yourself if you were to remove either of these two properties. Uh, but the two important properties of this, uh, of this interval here is that it's closed and that it is bounded. Um, so if we, you know, if you remove an endpoint here uh, so that you have an interval that's not closed anymore, you can come up with an example uh, that doesn't satisfy this theorem of a continuous function. Um, and if you make this closed interval unbounded, so say from A to infinity, uh, then this theorem doesn't have to be true either. So we see that uh, that closed bounded intervals are uh, are a an important um, an important type of set. So closed bounded intervals, closed and bounded intervals, are sort of more important than just closed intervals um, by themselves, right? So you have closed intervals, but closed intervals can be can be infinite. Uh, so closed and bounded intervals are important. Are very important. And in general, closed and bounded sets are going to be uh, very important. So removing the, uh, the interval here and just leaving the adjectives closed and bounded, um, sets that, are, that have both of those properties are going to be very important. And so those are the sets that are going to be called compact sets. So we'll precisely just define a compact set as a closed and bounded subset of Rn. Uh, this is actually not the book's definition. Uh, the book gives a different definition, but then proves it's equivalent to this, the definition I'm giving basically immediately. Um, so more or less, we're going to take uh, the definition uh, to be what in the book is a theorem, and then we'll have as a theorem what the book has as the definition. So essentially, there's kind of two different immediately kind of equivalent ways of describing uh, this notion of compactness. And so that's sort of our first uh, goal is to just def uh, to make a definition and then show it's equivalent to, uh, to a different way of talking about uh, such sets. Okay, so here's the definition uh, we'll give. Uh, a set K uh, is compact. Uh, so K for compact. Uh, in, in German, uh, the word is, begins with a K. Um, and uh, so that's compact if K is closed and bounded. Okay, so we know what a closed set is. Uh, you can probably guess what a bounded set is. Basically, a bounded set means you can just put the whole set in a big ball. Uh, so in other words, every time your X is in your set, uh, it's less than some fixed constant M. Okay, so there's some M. This would be the radius of the ball. The whole set is inside this ball. So that's how you can think about that geometrically. All right, so let's just uh, give some examples first. Uh, so an example, sort of easy example, of course, would be a closed and bounded interval, right, just an ordinary closed interval from A to B uh, in in a, in the real numbers. Uh, more generally, we can talk about the closed ball in Rn. Uh, so any any ball ball of radius r around x closure uh, is compact since uh, since well, first of all, it's obviously closed uh, since it's obviously closed. And we can obviously uh, put this ball in a ball. Um, so if you, so let's say here's the origin in Rn, uh, here's x. Uh, so our we have a ball of radius r around x. All we have to do is sort of make this bigger ball uh, contain that ball there. And this bigger ball, uh, you know, the distance from zero to x here, that 
um, that is that and the ball of radius r, uh, of course, just has a radius of r. So we just need um, this bigger ball to have a radius which is bigger than r plus uh, plus norm x or or, uh, or length x, um, and we need it to be strictly bigger than. So this uh, this r ball is closed here. So um, if we just take r plus uh, length of x um, as the open ball, that would that wouldn't get points on the the boundary of this r ball here. So we just need to make it a little bit bigger. Uh, so what we can do is put this in a ball of radius length x plus r plus one. Obviously closed, uh, and also the ball of radius r around x is contained in the ball of radius length of x plus r plus 1 around 0. And that's easy to check uh, just with the triangle inequality. OK, so I'll just say easy check. All right, so this is our, um, our m here. So this, this will be our m. And so everything in this set is uh, has length less than m. Another example of a compact set would be the boundary of the closed ball, or, or the boundary of the open ball, either way. Um, so if we look at the boundary of the ball of radius r around x, uh, that is just the closure of the ball of radius r around x minus the interior. And the interior, sort of obvious or easy to see that the interior of, of, uh, of the ball of radius r around x is just the ball of radius r around x. Uh, so this, well, this is, or this set is just everything that's a distance less than or equal to r from x. And this is the everything that's a distance strictly less than uh, distance r from x. So this, really, this is just the sphere of everything exactly a distance of r from x. So this is everything, every y, such that the distance from x to y is exactly equal to r. Uh, this is, uh, is compact. Because it's obviously bounded, and that just comes from the fact that, by definition, this set is contained in the closed ball, and we just saw in the previous example that that's bounded. Uh, so, and this latter set is bounded. And then we just have to see that uh, it's a that it's a closed set, and it's also closed, uh, and it's closed because it's the because it's a closed set minus an open set. So it's the complement of an open set in a closed set. Uh, it's also closed as the complement of an open set. in a closed set. Uh, so in general, uh, in general, in general, if uh, u is open and f is closed, u minus f is open. Or sorry, I'm doing the, that, that actually is true, um, but I'm doing, I should be doing the other way around. Uh, so if, uh, yeah, so if u, sorry, u is open, f is closed, um, then f minus u f minus u, okay, so this is like, this is our closed set, open set, right, closed minus open is closed. Uh, and I think this is actually covered in uh, the homework assignment, 
um, that you're currently working on. So, um, so I won't fill in the details of this, but this is a pretty easy thing to check. Uh, good exercise for you to do yourself um, to see that you're comfortable with open and closed sets. So just, just try to check that for yourself. Fun little exercise. All right, and then another example not really a specific example, but a kind of broad class of examples or a way to construct new examples from given ones, um, is that if you take an arbitrary intersection of compact sets, then the resulting set is compact. Uh, so if, uh, if k sub lambda um, are compact sets, then the arbitrary intersection of those compact sets is compact. Okay, so um, it's so it's closed. Uh, it's closed since each of the k lambdas are closed. Uh, so since each k lambda is closed and arbitrary intersections intersections of closed sets are closed. Right? That's one of the properties of closed set we talked about when we discussed closed sets. And it's bounded well, you have this arbitrary intersection, right? The, you have a lot of uh, sets here, uh, potentially, but any, but this whole intersection is contained in any one of them, and any one of those sets is, is bounded by definition. Uh, and it's bounded since the arbitrary intersection is contained in, let's say, k sub mu uh, for any particular mu. And k mu is bounded. Okay, so this allows you to, you know, take either of the two uh, examples that we have up here and then start intersecting them. And the resulting thing is always going to be compact. And we also have a, uh, so this is like an analog of the, you know, arbitrary Arbitrary intersections of closed sets are closed. Arbitrary intersections of compact sets are compact. Um, we also have the finite uh, union of compact sets uh, being compact, similarly, um, similar to the corresponding property for closed sets. So we can say that uh, if um, K1 through K sub L are compact, then uh, the union from i equals 1 to L of ki is compact. Uh, it's obviously closed. We closed as the finite union of closed sets. And so it's obviously closed as the finite union of closed sets. And um, to see that it's bounded, note that uh, each of the compact sets here, so ki, um, is contained in a ball of some radius m sub i around 0. All right, so each compact set can be put in a big ball. Uh, so set setting m equal to the max of the mi's, we find that the union is contained in the ball of radius m um, around 0. Any point in this union is in one of these ki's. Uh, so if it's in one of the ki's, it's in uh, it's in a ball of radius m sub i. But a ball of radius m sub i is in the ball of radius m because m is bigger than or equal to m sub i. Okay, so just straightforward uh, proof there. Uh, so which says that? So this says 
says the union is bounded. Okay, so this gives you two ways to start creating new compact sets from given compact sets. So starting from the spheres and the closed balls, you can start taking arbitrary unions and finite, um, uh, sorry, arbitrary intersections and finite unions to create new compact sets. Um, and this can kind of get you to some weird places. For example, um, you can do kind of fractal-like construction um, like this. Uh, so you can start with a, uh, a closed ball in, uh, in red here. Uh, so it's, it's all the stuff inside of here. Um, and then you can make a pattern inside that ball. So, uh, so take smaller balls like these orange ones uh, arranged inside of that ball and then repeat that same pattern inside of each one of the orange balls. Um, so you have these orange balls, uh, their union is uh, another compact set, and then you have these green balls inside the orange ones, yellow ones inside all of the, the green ones. I stopped myself from repeating because that would have taken forever. Um, and then you can take the intersection of all of these sets. Uh, so each of them is compact uh, because they're just finite unions of compact sets. And then so they're intersection here is also going to be a compact set and it's going to be some weird uh, fractal like set and we'll talk um, more next week about a particular type of set um, a particular example of a set like this called the Cantor set in which is a, a weird subset of the real numbers uh, so compact sets uh, you know they can be pretty weird they can be pretty unlike um, you know a closed bounded interval so Closed bounded intervals are and closed balls, a um, good place to start thinking about compact sets, but keep in mind that you can get some pretty weird stuff uh, by doing this arbitrary intersection uh, by using these two um, properties to create new compact sets. So I guess while we're considering this weird example where you have this, um, this intersection, this countable intersection of compact sets, um, it would be natural to prove the following proposition. Uh, so basically the uh, nested interval property holds if you replace interval with compact set. Um, so if you have nested compact sets the way we do here, then the intersection is not empty. Uh, so this thing here is going to be non-empty by the following proposition, which is just the nested interval property for compact sets. Um, and you should be able to easily come up with an example, I think you may have done it for homework already, uh, that the nested interval property doesn't work for just closed intervals. Uh, so if you try to, if you take nested closed intervals, you can end up with an empty intersection. Um, but closed and bounded intervals, um, so compact sets, that always, that always works. And, um, and so here we're generalizing uh, to just general closed bounded sets. Okay, so our proposition here um, is just the nested interval property. So it says if um, if k i are compact and k i and this is i goes from one to infinity uh, and k i uh, contains k i plus one, then the intersection of all of these sets is not empty. The intersection. of ki is not empty. And this is fairly straightforward to prove actually. Um, so basically you can kind of you know think about your compact sets uh, being nested like this. And what you're going to do is just take um, an x1 and k1 um, x2 in k2, x3 in k3. And since this, uh, since your first set, you know, this whole sequence is contained in just the first compact set, right? Because our sets are nested. Uh, so that means that we have a bounded sequence here. And so when you take, you just take this arbitrary sequence, ki or xi and ki, right? Well, that implies that xi, they're all in k1. So this implies that our xi is bounded. So bounded sequence. And so by bolton of um, we have x sub i k, a subsequence uh, converging. So that converges to some x. And then the claim is that the x that that converges to uh, is going to be 
in every single one of those sets. Uh, so x is in k sub j for any j. Okay, so let's uh, let's just write that part of the proof down first. So I'm going to give myself some room here. Okay, so take uh, xi in ki arbitrarily. Uh, since each uh, ki is contained in k1, um, xi is in k1 for all i. So since k1 is bounded, the sequence xi is bounded. And we don't need this stuff anymore. And uh, so by bolts on a virus Strauss, K1 is bounded, uh, XI is bounded, thus X sub I sub K converges to some X for some subsequence by bolts on a virus Strauss. So we claim that x is actually in uh, all of the of the kj's and therefore in the intersection. Uh, so we claim that x is in kj for all j. All right, that, we can get rid of this. So to get an idea of uh, how to show this, um, let's just again sort of visualize the situation. So we have this sequence x1, x2, x3, x4, etc. Uh, so let's see. So why you know why should this x be in say k4 um, in here? Well, once we get to x4, right, the whole sequence after that point is in k4, right? Because it keeps going because our sets are nested and every x keeps going further down um, into the you know, into the sort of Russian dolls that we have nested here. Uh, so after x4, our whole sequence is in k4, and therefore uh, the limit, right, so so in particular the subsequence um, is going to eventually be in k4. And so we have a subsequence in k4 here, and k4 is closed because it's a compact set. Um, so its limit must be uh, must be also in that set. Right, but this argument, the same argument works for any k, right? not just k4. We pick any k, eventually the sequence and therefore eventually the subsequence must be in there. So we can just think of that as a sequence in that particular set k and then by the closure of k, because k is closed, it has to contain its limit points. Okay, so that's the idea. We just have to uh, write that all down. So that's what we'll do now. Okay, so we claim that x is in uh, kj for all j. Well, why is that? Um, well, that's because this subsequence, if we go to the jth term in the subsequence, right, that'll actually be further along in the sequence than the actual jth term of the sequence. Right? But once we hit the jth term of the actual sequence, we're in k sub j after that. Right? So once we hit the jth term of the subsequence, we're definitely in k sub j by that point. And then so just thinking about that sequence, that's going to limit uh, that uh, limit to x, um, but it's going to be in this closed set. So that limit must be in that set. Uh, okay, so we claim that x is in kj for all j. Uh, this is because the sequence... So if we take um, x sub i sub k, but we take that starting at k equals j to infinity. So this is because uh, that sequence is in k sub j for all little k. Okay, uh, so it's because that sequence is in k sub j for all k and limits to x 
but KJ is closed, so must contain any limit point. And I think I'd just like to clarify here um, that, so the reason this sequence, uh, this little subsequence here is in kj for all k, uh, this is by the nesting. So this is because the sets are nested. Uh, the k sub i are nested. Okay, so basically um, your x sub i k, that is in uh, k sub i k, but k sub i k, i sub k is bigger than uh, or equal to k. So that means that that's contained in k sub little k, and little k is bigger than or equal to j. So um, k sub k is contained in k sub j. Okay, so that's the argument, uh, rigorous argument you can make there. All right, so, um, so we have uh, the x is in kj for all j, uh, since x is in kj for all j, x is in the intersection. Okay, and so that completes the proof. Okay, so now we're going to prove that uh, our the definition we've given here for a compact set is equivalent to the definition that's given in the text. Okay, so in the text, um, this definition is a theorem. Um, it's a consequence of the text definition of uh, K being compact. So for us, um, we're taking the theorem as the definition and then uh, deriving the definition uh, in the text as a theorem. Okay, so we're just sort of doing things in reverse. It doesn't matter because um, both statements are equivalent. Um, and so the equivalent statement uh, sort of comes from the following consideration. If you think about a compact set, um, it's uh, closed and bounded. Well, where does this uh, where does this bounded come up um, in analysis? You know, where where else have we seen this as a hypothesis? Well, we've seen that in the uh, bolzano weierstrass theorem, right? Which we already used uh, in our proof of the previous uh, proposition. So. You know, a bounded sequence always has a subsequence which converges. So, in other words, if we take a sequence by, so we make a sequence by picking points out of our set K, right, then that sequence will be bounded. And so we'll have a subsequence which converges, but that subsequence is just a sequence in our compact set. And since our set is closed, that means that the limit of that subsequence is going to be in the compact set. Okay, so in other words, if you have a compact set, and you pick points out of it to make a sequence, then there has to be a subsequence which converges to something else in that set K. Okay, um, so this is actually an equivalent description of a set being compact. So if a compact set has the property that whenever you make a sequence using points of the set, uh, it always has a subsequence converging to something in the set, then your set has to be compact in the sense that it's closed and bounded as we've defined here. Okay, so we will, uh, in the next proposition, prove that equivalence. All right, so here's the theorem. This is everything, just writing down everything I just said. Um, a set is compact, that is closed and bounded, if and only if any sequence in the set has a subsequence which converges to something in the set. Okay, so there's, there's two parts here. Um, there has to exist a subsequence of this sequence which is convergent, and... Uh, the convergence is to something that's in the set. Okay, so the proof in the forward direction is what I outlined above. Uh, so if xj is a sequence in k, uh, then xj is bounded since k is. Uh, then the boltzano weierstrass theorem boltzano weierstrass implies there is a subsequence x sub j sub k 
which converges to x, some x, for some x. But k is closed, so it contains its limit points. So it contains the limit. Okay, so all these x uh, sub jk's are in k itself, so um, the limit of that sequence has to be also in k. Okay, so that's straightforward. Let's go the other way. So this we'll do by uh, contraposition. So we want to take this statement and say that that implies that k is compact. So what we'll actually show is that if k is not compact, uh, then there's some sequence that, uh, that doesn't satisfy this, um, this statement here. Okay, so this is going to be by contrapositive. Okay, so assume that k is not compact. It is not compact. Then k is either not closed or not bounded. So if k is not closed, Well, k is closed. Um, k is closed if and only if, when you have a sequence in k converging uh, to something, then um, then that limit is in k. So, in other words, for k to not be closed, there's got to be some sequence of things in k which converges to something not in k. So, k is not closed. There is a sequence. Uh, x sub i in k, I guess I'm using j, x sub j in k, uh, such that x sub j converges to x, which is not in k. Well, then any subsequence here we know must also converge to x. So we can't have, so there's no subsequence that's going to converge to something in k because every subsequence is converging to this x, which is not in k. So then every sequence, or sorry, every subsequence also converges to x not in k. So the theorem is proved in this case. And then if k is not bounded, if, on the other hand, k is not bounded, then there, well, what does it mean for k to not be bounded? That means that no matter what big ball I choose, there's always some element of k outside of that ball. Uh, so then there are um, x n in k such that the length of xn is bigger than or equal to n for each n in the natural numbers. Well, then any subsequence of this sequence is unbounded. Then any subsequence of xn is unbounded. Easy to see. Um, so, so it's not convergent. And the theorem is proved. Okay, so that's the, that's the negation of, uh, so that, right, shows that this isn't true. Okay, so that, that completes the proof, and the theorem is proved. Okay, relatively straightforward. Okay, so those are both relatively familiar kind of definitions of compactness, or definitions of compactness in terms of things which are familiar. Uh, but there's the third 
uh, conception of compactness, which r- arose historically. Uh, and the reason it arose uh, is was in connection with trying to prove a particular theorem. So there's a, a theorem um, in analysis about continuous functions, which says that a, uh, a continuous function on a closed interval, a closed and bounded interval, uh, is uniformly continuous. Now, I don't expect you to know what that means right now. Um, it would be something you would study in a further analysis course. But I just want to say this as motivation to say that this definition of compactness, um, it didn't arise you know, out of, out of the ether uh, for no reason. Uh, it arose because people were thinking about a particular problem. So the definition is going to seem kind of abstract and like, where did this come from? But uh, I just think feel like you should know that it arose out of uh, necessity, people trying to actually solve a problem. Uh, So there's a good reason historically for this definition to have arisen. Uh, And in fact, this definition of compactness or alternative conception of compactness is the main one that's used in the uh, in the subject of topology. Uh, so in a way, this is the this is the real definition of compactness in some sense. Um, so in the general subject of topology, this definition I'm about to give is the more general uh, definition that covers all situations. And the ones that we've given uh, only work in specialized situations like in Rn. And this definition uh, is in terms of open covers. And it might feel a little bit weird uh, to begin with. It might might seem a little bit abstract. Just give yourself some time to get used to it. Uh, It really is not all that um, difficult to work with once you get used to it. So the conception of compactness that we're going to discuss is that um, a set is compact if any open cover has a finite subcover. So first I have to tell you uh, what an open cover of a set is. Uh, So an open cover of a set S is a collection of open sets. So let's say U sub lambda where lambda is in lambda, some indexing set. It's a collection of open sets such that, well, S is covered by these open sets. So S is contained in the union of these open sets. Okay, that's it. And I think the you know the intuition is pretty pretty simple to understand. You might wonder why anybody would care to th- uh, to think about this you know, this concept, but the concept itself, is, I think, is easy enough to understand. You have the so the set uh, sitting there, right? So here's your set S, and then you just have a cover by open sets. So, you know, these open sets, they might be open balls. Uh, so you can take, you know, just take enough of these, enough open balls to cover the entire set S. Okay, so you have these uh, open balls and their union is covering the set S. So that would be an open cover. Okay, so this would be an example of an open cover. by open balls. So let's consider an actual example here. Uh, So what we can do is we can take uh, the u, so we can take our u's, so the u sub lambda, so u sub lambda is just going to be, so lambda is going to be a real number, so this is just going to be the interval uh, from lambda minus one-fourth um, to lambda plus one-fourth, and the lambdas are just going to be in the interval from, let's say, the closed interval from zero to one. Okay, so lambda is going to be in capital lambda, which is the closed interval from 0 to 1. OK, 
Okay, so in other words, um, what we're doing is for every uh, real number between zero and one here in this closed interval, we're attaching an interval of length one half centered around that point. Okay, so just imagine everything in here, we're just attaching an interval um, with center lambda of length one half to it. Okay, so this is our collection of intervals. Uh, so then, so this, uh, so this collection, so then the u lambdas here um, are an open cover of the uh, of the two sets of zero one the open interval and zero one the closed interval. And that's because if we consider the union of all the u lambdas, well, that's sort of intuitively the case. We're just taking all these open intervals um, across this closed interval here and uni uni unioning them up. Uh, and so that's going to extend from, well, the furthest left it can go is one quarter to the left of zero, and then the furthest right it can go is one quarter to the right of one. So this is just going to be the open interval from negative one quarter to five quarters. Okay, so the union clearly covers all of that stuff. Now what you might notice here is that this is way overkill. Right, this um, you don't need all of these intervals to cover uh, each of these things here. So, for example, um, you can get away with just three intervals to cover uh, zero one. So let's say uh, so this is overkill. So, for example, um, zero one is contained in. Uh, let's see, so if we take u sub one fourth, right, then that extends from uh, zero to one half, not including one half. Um, and then we can take u sub one half to get u sub one half, and then we can also take uh, u sub three quarters. And so these three u's here are sufficient to cover zero one. These three u's, they also come from this collection, uh, u lambda. So what this is called is it's a subcover, right? Because it's a so you take a subset of the cover we were originally looking at, and it still covers uh, zero to one. And in fact, it's a finite subcover. So there's finitely many things here. So we picked finitely many things out of here, and they still cover this um, this interval. Uh, so this is called this is an example. An example of a finite subcover. Uh, so another example, so another example, we can also cover uh, the closed interval from zero to one with three. Of these uh, of these u's, but we can't use the same three here because uh, these this only this exactly actually this union is exactly equal to zero one if you think about it, uh, but we can uh, find a few u's that uh, that do the job for the closed interval from, from zero to one as well. So you know if you think about your closed interval from uh, zero to one, you can put uh, one of these things around. Uh, one half, so it goes from one quarter to three quarters open, and then all you have to do is take another one of these things that sort of links together with that one, and so all you need is like a little bit of overlap here. Uh, put the center somewhere here, and then that'll cover all of that, and then a little overlap here, um, and sort of center over here, and then that'll cover all of that. Uh, so I think if you just take um, u sub one fifth. Uh, and u sub one half and u sub four fifths that should work. All right, so let's make a, a definition to make this finite subcover thing official. So if uh, u lambda 
is an open cover of S, then U1 through UK contained in U lambda is a finite subcover if so the finite part is while well, there's already only um, there's finitely many here the sub part is that they come from the original collection that we we're looking at and the cover part is the only other thing we have to, to say um, so if the union of these finitely many things actually does cover s okay so finite subcover Okay, so you have finite sub and cover, so three three ingredients, finitely many things taken from the collection which cover our set S. Okay, so we saw examples of that um, in the in the previous example of what a, a finite sub cover can look like, um, but uh, the sort of the most well, one thing to notice is that um, a an open cover doesn't have to have a finite sub cover. So here's an example. So a, uh, an open cover need not have a finite subcover. So consider, consider u sub n equal to the interval from 0 to 1 minus 1 over n. So then this collection of u sub n's is an open cover of the interval from 0 to 1, right? That's obvious. If you take any uh, y in this interval, right, you can always take n large enough so that 1 minus n is, uh, 1, 1 minus 1 over n is bigger than y, right? So, uh, this, so this un interval will cover that y y will be in that un. Um, it's an open cover of uh, 0, 1, but it obviously obviously has no finite subcover. Okay, because if we only take, I think this should be clear, if we only take finitely many of these, right, you just take the n which is uh, largest among those finitely many. So say you have n1 through nk, you take the nk, which is the largest one, and then the union of u1 through unk uh, is just equal to the u sub n, which is the largest, right? And the such a u sub n is not equal to the entire interval from 0 to 1. Okay, so no finite number of these is going to cover the interval from 0 to 1. And the theorem about compactness that we have is basically going to say that you know, no matter how hard you try, you can't come up with an example for the closed interval. No matter what open cover you take of the closed interval here uh, from 0 to 1, you're always going to be able to find a finite subcover strictly um, exactly because this set is compact. So any compact set, uh, if you have an open cover of it, you'll be able to find a finite subcover. And that, that is exactly an equivalent uh, description of compactness. So it's actually equivalent to the definitions that we've given uh, in Rn. And so that is the content of the heine borel theorem. All right, so here is the heine borel theorem, uh, sort of the, the culmination of our brief discussion there. Uh, a set is compact uh, in Rn. So a set in Rn is compact if and only if every open cover of the set has a finite subcover. So this is an equivalent description of compactness. It looks very different from the descriptions that we've give the two descriptions that we've given so far, but nonetheless, this is exactly equivalent, means the same thing logically. All right, so let's take a look at the proof. We'll first do this direction. So we'll do this again by contrapositive. 
by contraposition. So we're trying to prove this implies compact, so we'll say not compact implies not that. Okay, so in other words, we'll show that if our set is not compact, that uh, there is an open cover that doesn't have a finite subcover. So, um, so assume K is not compact. Again, then K is not closed or K is not bounded. If K is not closed, there is a sequence. So there's a sequence X uh, sub I, let's say, which the sequence is in K, sequence in K uh, such that the sequence converges to some X, which is not in K. Okay, so somehow we're gonna use this to create an open cover um, that has no finite subcover. And the way we're gonna do that is we have this limit point here, X, which is not in K. And what we can do is we can take closed balls around this X, so we can take a closed ball, uh, say radius one, and then a closed ball of radius one half, and a closed ball of radius one third. And we'll look at the complements of those balls. So actually what we're gonna look at is like the complement of this first ball here. Um, this is gonna be U1. And then we would have the complement of the other ball the next ball in line. Uh, so that would be, let me see, I guess I'd do sort of lines like this. That's going to be U2. Um, and these sets, since they're, uh, since the sets are getting bigger and bigger sort of towards this X, uh, they're going to cover K, right? X is not in K, so this is not a point we have to cover. We just have to cover everything um, exterior to X, and that will cover K. So these U's will be an open cover, and they clearly won't have a finite subcover because any finite number of them is only gonna get so close to X, but this sequence is getting arbitrarily close to X. So we're gonna miss some elements of this sequence uh, by doing this construction. Okay, so that's the basic idea there. Okay, so define to find u sub i to be equal to the ball, sorry, it's gonna be, so we're gonna take the ball of radius one over i around x, its closure complement, okay? So um, we need an open set, so it's gonna be the complement of that closed set. So we define u sub i that way, um, and then we, so two claims. So the claim is that the set of UIs, I from one to infinity, is an open cover of K with no finite subcover. So what we can do is uh, note Note the UI are clearly open and that uh, and the union of all of these UIs, that's the union of these complements. And the union of a complement is the um, it's the complement of the intersection. So we have this is one of De Morgan's laws. So you have the uh, the intersection of all of these bi's complement, and that intersection is clearly the set with just the point x in it. 
right? And so this is just Rn minus x. And since x is not in k, that contains k. Okay, so this is an open cover. Uh, so ui is an open cover. Uh, however, if we consider any finite subset u1 through ul, uh, what we can do is just take the biggest L and if we take the biggest L, then actually the union of u1 through ul will just be that biggest, uh, that u with the biggest L. Um, any finite subset, consider, or I guess, sorry, I should have said, I realized I, I didn't do a good job labeling these. So this should be u sub i sub 1, u sub i sub l. Uh, so we consider any finite subset, let, uh, let's see, let, um, let, I don't know, m be equal to the max of uh, i1, etc. up to i l. So what I'm going to say is um, the, so the ball with radius uh, 1 over m, right, uh, that is the smallest ball. So when we take the closure and the complement, the u sub m, that's going to be the biggest u. All right, so then uh, the ball of radius 1 over m around x closure, that's contained in the ball of radius 1 over i sub j around x, the closure. And that's just equivalent to saying that when we take complements, that the u sub i j is contained in u sub m uh, for any i j. Thus, the union of these is just, the union of these finitely many u's is just um. Thus, um is equal to this finite union. Um, uh, so we have j from 1 to l of the u i j. And now all we're going to say is that, well, this set can't be covering k because um, because there's going to be, because the sequence is going to x, and that sequence has to get arbitrarily close to x, whereas this, this set sort of stops a finite distance away from x. So we can say, uh, but, uh, but there is an n such that when little n is bigger than or equal to uh, big N, or I guess maybe I'll say I, so when I is bigger than or equal to big N, we have that the distance between X sub I and X is less than 1 over M. So IE, um, XI is in the ball of radius 1 over m around x. And in particular, it's in the closed ball, right? So this means, so xi cannot be in the complement of that ball. This implies, this shows um, which equals this finite union does not cover k.
Okay, so this cover has no finite subcover. So this cover has no finite subcover. Okay, now that was just one part. So we said if k is not closed, then we made an argument, we found a cover that doesn't have a finite subcover. So if k is not bounded, now suppose k is not bounded. This one is easier. Um, so this means, so then there are xn in k such that the length of xn is bigger than or equal to n for each n, for n in the natural numbers. But then what we can do is you can just take, right, so this just says that xn lies outside a big ball of radius n. So you can just take the interior of those balls to be uh, the open cover. So define, defining u sub n to just be the ball of radius n around zero. Uh, clearly, the collection of all those uns is an open cover of k. I mean, in fact, it's an open cover of all of Rn, okay? Uh, so it's going to cover any subset. Uh, but no finite subcover works uh, because, right, you can just take the largest n and then there's going to be some xn's outside of that. Uh, so that's very straightforward. Uh, so clearly that's an open cover, uh, but there's obviously no finite subcover. Okay, so again, you just, if you have finitely many, you just find the biggest n, um, and then the, the finite union of those things is just contained in that single, right, is just that single one. Uh, so it's just the single ball. I right, see so your union of finitely many is just a single ball, but you can always find elements of your set outside of that single ball by definition of k not being bounded. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to, we, we have to get to the other half of the proof, um, so I'll just... Uh, leave you to write out the details if you don't if you don't quite see them. All right, now the more interesting direction of this proof is this way. This is the more substantial and difficult um, half of the proof. So what we'll do is first, as so we'll first, we first show that any countable. cover of k has a finite subcover. So um, in general, a, a cover doesn't, there, there's no constraint on how many sets can be in a cover. Uh, so basically what we're going to do is we'll show that the, the proof is pretty easy when you have the countable case, and then we'll have to show that we can reduce the general case to the countable case. Um, which is interesting, an interesting step in its own right, um, and, and tells us something interesting about the about Rn and the subsets of Rn. Uh, so we first show that any countable cover has a finite subcover. Uh, we argue by contradiction So suppose that u i i equals one to infinity. Uh, is a cover of k, which is compact, with no finite subcover. The idea here is actually relatively simple. Um, if we consider our first open set u1, that doesn't cover k, so we'll have some x1 outside of u1. And then our u2 um, if we take u2 here and consider the union of u1 and u2, there's something outside of all of that, right? Say x2. And then if you consider u3, uh, that 
is, you know, so the three of these things, that's just a finite, uh, a finite subset. So that doesn't cover either. And so we get an X3 outside of there. And we just keep going like this um, to get a sequence. But since K is compact, this sequence will have a convergent subsequence. The problem is, where is this thing going to be converging to? Because we're going to exhaust all of the sets here, right? These sets are covering our set K. So we're sort of this, uh, we're sort of pushing this sequence out, you know, away from the set K because each of these U's is covering the entire, right? When we consider the totality of all the U's, that's covering all of K. So this sequence here is sort of intuitively being pushed away from the entire set K. So whatever it's converging to can't possibly be in K. Um, and so that's going to yield a contradiction because the limit is supposed to, the limit is going to exist of this subsequence and it, and it should be in K because K is closed, uh, but we'll be forced to uh, conclude that it can't possibly be in K because it's being pushed away from all of these open sets, which are covering K. All right. So that's the outline of the argument, uh, relatively straightforward in the, in the countable case. Um, so th yeah, so the countable case relies on the fact that um, we can sort of build up to the full cover um, from the finite, right? So we can take u1, then u1, u2, u1, u2, u3, go on that way and exhaust the entire cover sort of ad infinity. Um, if we have an uncountable collection of sets, then we can't do that, right? We could take that, fi you know, some finite collection of open sets like that, but then when we take their union, there still might be a lot of stuff left over, um, and we, they might not cover all of K. So that's sort of the complication when it's not countable. Um, all right, so, so what we're going to do is, um, so define, uh, define, define VI to be the union of U1 through UI. Uh, so since, the, uh, since VI is, uh, does not contain the set K, there is an XI in K such that XI is not in VI. Okay, so this sequence now, the sequence XI is bounded since K is bounded. So the Bolzano-Weierstrass theorem, so by Bolzano-Weierstrass, uh, there is a convergent subsequence. A subsequence x sub i sub k converging to x. And this x is in k, additionally, x is in k since k is closed. But if x is in k, then x is going to have to be in one of these u's, right? But if x is in one of those u's, then that means that uh, that x is in one of the uh, is in one of the v's. But the problem with that is that um, the xi's are converging to x, so they're going to have to be getting you know inside that open set. Right? So there's going to be a little ball around x where the xi's have where that little ball is in. Uh, is in the UI, and XI is going to have to be getting in there, uh, but it's not supposed to be, be by construction. So there's sort of a, a problem there. All right, so since X is in K, but then X is in UJ, uh, which is in VJ for some J, and UJ is open. So there's a ball of radius epsilon, which is contained in uj, contained in vj, uh, for some epsilon. However, there is an n such that when little n is bigger than or equal to n, we have x sub i sub n. And that's our subsequence um, within epsilon of x. So that means that this is in the epsilon ball around x. And that's in uh, vj. 
So in particular, uh, we can take, we can ensure that little n is bigger than or equal to j. If this is the case, then this x sub i n, that's in v j, uh, but v j, each of the v's is contained in the, in the next one, right? Because we're only just adding on a u set. Uh, so that means that v j is contained in v n, uh, but n is less than or equal to i sub n. So this is contained in v sub i sub n. And that is in contradiction to the nature of the x sub i's, right? Um, but x sub i n is not in v sub i n, a contradiction. OK, so that completes uh, the proof in the case where we have a countable cover. OK, so this completes the proof for countable covers. So in the general case, case of an arbitrary cover, u sub lambda, all right, so an arbitrary cover u sub lambda of k, we claim that, in fact, there is a countable subcover. Uh, we claim that there is a countable subcover of k. So if this is the case, the proof is complete. Proof is complete since the previous paragraph shows that we can find a finite subcover of this countable subcover. Since the previous paragraph shows there must be a finite subcover of this countable subcover. And a subcover of a subcover is a, is a subcover, of course. So it shows there must be a finite subcover of this countable subcover. So we just need to prove the following lemma. Okay, so the lemma is this, um, that any subset of Rn, so any subset Or I guess I should, well, I'll say it this way: any uh, any open cover u lambda of a subset S in R n has a countable subcover. Any subset whatsoever uh, doesn't have to be compact has a countable subcover. Okay, so what we're proving, our main goal is to prove that any compact set, um, if you have an open cover, it has a finite subcover. But in fact, any old subset of Rn whatsoever also always has a countable subcover. So you can always take a, an arbitrary open cover down to a countable subcover, which is sort of interesting in itself. Um, and in topology, uh, in the subject of topology, um, S would be said to be a Lindelöf space. Uh, so any space where you can reduce an open cover to a countable subcover is said to be Lindelöf, uh, named after some, some guy, uh, not as catchy as compact. All right, so here's the proof of the lemma. What it does is it makes key use of the fact that there's a countable 
uh, open cover of Rn, a uh, very particular, useful, countable cover of Rn. Uh, so the, the main ingredient of the proof is the countable cover So it's the set of u, so I'll describe them this way, u sub r sub n. Um, and this is a, it's merely just a ball, open ball, of radius 1 over n around this point r. And r is an element of q to the, oh, sorry, I just wrote, so I'll call this k because n is the dimension of my Euclidean space. Uh, so, so this is q to the n. Okay, so you have a point with all rational coordinates, um, and, uh, and n is, or k is a natural number here. Okay, so this, this set is clearly in bijective correspondence with q to the n cross n, so it's, a, it's definitely countable. Um, and the fact that it's a cover follows straightforwardly from the fact that Q is dense in R. Okay, so you can always get, for any point in Rn, you could always get a point, uh, a rational number, a, a rational point in Rn, a point whose all of whose coordinates are rational, arbitrarily close to, uh, to X. So I'll leave that to you. Just use the fact that Q... Uh, is dense in R to to see that this is an open cover that this um, that any any x in R n is in one of these balls. So we use the countable cover uh, that of R n. Uh, so let let u lambda cover s where u lambda are open. Right, so kind of the basic idea here is that if we think about one of these u lambdas, it's going to be totally filled up with, um, with these rational balls uh, with the 1 over k radii. Right, so these rational points are sort of densely distributed in Rn, and you have the balls are getting arbitrarily small. Right, so these u lambda is going to be filled up completely, you know, with all of these balls uh, from that special countable collection. So let's, uh, for notation's sake, let's uh, let's call this countable cover C here. Um, so if we consider, so consider D. So D is going to be the set of uh, v, which are in C, okay, so sets from C, these uh, rational balls, rationally centered balls, um, such that V is contained in U lambda for some lambda. Well, the claim now is uh, that this D, right, since these, it's these U lambdas are going to be completely filled up um, with these, uh, with these things. And so the claim is that this D uh, is actually a, uh, a cover of S. Okay, so, so we're going to claim uh, that D is a countable cover, a countable cover of S. And then what this is going to allow us to do is choose a countable subcover of U lambda. Um, because for each one of these balls here, these little balls in this collection D, what we can do is allow this ball to pick its favorite u lambda that it's sitting in. Okay, so pick a single one. So this, you know, this this guy here is sitting in this u lambda. It might be sitting in this, in some other u mu, but it just picks one of the one of these big sets that it's in. Um, and if we do that, the resulting collection of u lambdas that we get from allowing the sets in D to pick their favorite u lambda is going to be a countable 
um, a countable collection of open sets, and because D is a cover of S, and the U lambdas are bigger than everything in D, um, the, those resulting U lambdas are going to be a cover, and it's going to be countable. Okay, so we sort of use these... Um, use this countable collection here to choose a suitable countable collection of u lambdas and use the fact that this d is going to be a cover to say that that resulting uh, collection of u lambdas is uh, is also a cover okay so that's that's the plan for the proof here uh, so we define so define D to be the set of V in this collection C, such that V is in U lambda for some U lambda. Uh, so this is clearly, so since uh, D is contained in C, this is countable. D is countable. Um, we claim that in fact D is a cover. We claim that D covers S. So let X be in S, and we just have to show that um, one of these uh, V's uh, contains X. And if X is in S, uh, then X is in U lambda for some lambda, And u lambda is open. So there's an epsilon ball around x, which is contained in u lambda. So we get a picture like this. We have here's u lambda, here's x, and we have an epsilon ball around x. And what we need to say is that there's one of these rationally centered balls uh, which has x in it and is inside u lambda. Right? We want it to be inside u lambda, so it's in this collection d, and we want it to cover x um, to say that, that this d covers our set s. So what we want is for this uh, rational point um, to be within 1 over k of x. Right? This would say x is in the 1 over k ball around r, and to guarantee that that 1 over k ball around r is in u lambda, we'll just guarantee that it's actually in this epsilon ball. Um, and we can do that by, uh, by considering the epsilon ball, uh, so we sort of shrink the epsilon ball to epsilon over 2. So if we take epsilon over 2 ball there, and we take our 1 over k uh, less than that, um, than that epsilon over 2, then there's going to be a rational point um, within that 1 over k. So this is sort of epsilon over 2. Uh, and then we can take 1 over k to be even closer. Uh, so 1 over k will be in there. And so we can find a rational ball within that, um, within that 1 over k. And then the ball of radius 1 over k uh, is around whatever that rational point is. So once we pick the rational point, say, there, uh, the 1 over k ball around that rational point is going to contain x uh, because uh, just by, by construction, because uh, it's inside the, this 1 over k thing here. And the 1 over k ball around that green point um, can only extend out uh, less than, it's going to extend out less than epsilon over 2, but this, uh, this green point is not going to be out further than epsilon over 2. So everything in that ball around R is going to uh, fall within this big epsilon ball. All right, so, uh, so what we do is um, so choose, choose k such that uh, 1 over k is less than epsilon over 2, and then take and r in q to the n such that r minus x, uh, the distance between r and x, is less than 1 over k. All right, and then simply the claim is just that, uh, then it's easy to check just using the triangle inequality. It is easy to check that 
that the ball around R of radius 1 over K uh, is actually contained in the epsilon ball around X. And, um, and then that, of course, is contained in U lambda. Okay, so this is our, um, so x is in b sub 1 over k of r, uh, and that is in d. That set is in d, uh, and so that, that verifies that d is a cover, so thus d covers s. Okay, so now we're in good shape. We just let every... Um, any one of these countable sets in D choose its favorite U lambda that it's sitting inside, right? And then, so we have countable many things. They're making a single choice. The resulting choices, uh, there's only going to be at most countably many, right? So some of the different Vs in here might choose the same U lambda, but it's not increasing the cardinality. Um, so now uh, to, each, to each V in D, uh, associate arbitrarily a uh, u, let's say u sub lambda sub v. Okay, so this v is choosing one of these u sub lambdas uh, such that v is contained in that u sub lambda sub v. Okay. Um, and then, so then the claim is then the u sub lambda sub v, uh, where v is in d, is an open cover, is a countable open cover. Open cover of s uh, because we know that S is contained in uh, the union of, so if we take the union of all of the Vs, where V is in D, right, we showed that, that that D is a cover, so that, that uh, contains S, excuse me, contains S, and the Vs, well, V is in U sub lambda V, right? So this is, uh, this is contained in the union V and D of the U sub lambda V. Okay, and so that completes the proof. So there's our countable cover, our countable open uh, subcover. So then this completes the proof of the lemma. Completes the proof of the lemma. And then with the lemma proved, um, the this completes the proof of the Heine Borel theorem. Okay, so this completes the proof of Heine Borel. Okay, sorry, I went a little bit longer than I was expecting. Uh, but I just needed, wanted to get through this material. It didn't really make sense to save it for the second video. Uh, so that's all for this material on compact sets.